This is week number four of the series we've been in, This Is That, and last week we actually had a technical difficulty where none of the services from our weekend were actually recorded, so I am re-recording this message now without a live audience, so it is just me and you, but there has been many people asking this week for uh, the message, and so we wanted to get something out and online and uploaded for you to either watch or listen to. So let me say welcome to all of you that are listening through the internet, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on iTunes or through our website. Uh, thanks for tuning in and joining us. Again, this is week number four of This Is That. We've been in this series looking at four areas of Christianity that many people have been confused by. And here's the danger. Anytime you're confused by something, you'll tend to kind of keep it in an arm's distance. And it actually could be something that's really good for you. And so the story we've been looking at in the book of Acts was that very thing taking place where a group of people were rejecting and even making fun of something that they were actually waiting for their entire life. So let's look at that. In Acts chapter 2, it says, the amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? So what's taking place is the Holy Spirit, the gift that Jesus promised, comes to empower the church. And when he finally showed up, People didn't understand what was taking place, and some even made fun of them, and their, their, their thought was, here's the problem. This is why they're acting that way. They're drunk. They've had way too much wine. So Peter stands up with the 11. He raises his voice, and he addresses the crowd, fellow Jews, and all of you live in Jerusalem, and even us living here today, let me explain this to you. And that's been the goal this entire month, is to take some areas that people have been confused by and explain them to you. Listen carefully to what I say, Peter says. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is that. This is actually that which the prophet Joel spoke about. And he went on to, to quote Joel from the Old Testament. It was a prophet. He gave a message. And the people had been waiting for this to happen their entire life. Their grandparents waited for it. Their parents waited for it. And when it actually happened, because they didn't understand what was going on, they thought it was this, and it was actually that. So week number one, we dove deeper into this story, and we dealt with the Holy Spirit. Many people are kind of keeping the Holy Spirit at an arm's length. They, they embrace God the Father, embrace God the Son, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, they kind of kept him at a distance. Uh, week number two, we dealt with the whole area of praise and worship. Why do we sing in church? Why is there fast songs and slow songs? Uh, what, what, what is it all about? Week number three, we dealt with an area that a lot of people struggle with, which is on the area of healing. Why does God heal some people and not others? And why doesn't he just heal everyone all the time? Today, I want to deal with an area that many, many people are confused by, and, and you see the proof of it in just the sheer statistics of the people not embracing something that actually could be incredible for their life. So what I want to do today is we're going to talk about money and the church, the relationship between money and the church, because money is the number one reason why people, at least here in America, stay away from God and stay away from the church. The thought is all the church wants is my money. They just, they just want my money. And the problem is we've had a lot of bad teaching on the relationship between the church and money. We've had bad teaching. We've also had people misuse money in the church. Uh, we've had everything from the extreme of the prosperity gospel, which God just wants to make you rich, and the hundredfold return, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it, because if there was a hundredfold return that you're going to make 100% every time you give to God... Every Christian in the world today would be a quadrillionaire. I mean, it would just, it, the, the math just doesn't add up. And you have the other extreme of the poverty gospel that if you want to be holy and you want to live a life that God approves of, you got to give everything away and just live in poverty. Both extremes are wrong. The truth is, God wants you to have more than you need, more than you consume on a weekly basis so that you have the ability to be generous. See, the truth is we are blessed to be a blessing. There's a purpose. And so if all I have is enough to get through my week and I don't have anything left over, I don't have the ability to be like God. Our God is a very generous God, and he wants us to resemble him. He wants us to look like the Father. And God so loved the world that he gave. And so we are called to be givers and called to be generous, which means I need more than I'm currently consuming 
to be able to do that. And here's the truth. Anybody can do that anywhere in the world. You can live in an impoverished village in Africa, living yourself in poverty and still have more than what you currently consume on a weekly basis to help other people. So this isn't a get rich quick thing. This is simply we want to live a life of generosity, live a life blessing others. But here's where it gets really confusing. It's the relationship between money and the church. And so I want to go to the clearest passage in the Bible that talks about what does this relationship look like? Because again, we've heard a lot of weird teaching, and then we've even had pastors misuse and abuse money. Uh, I, I met a guy in his 80s who stayed away from God, stayed away from church for over 50 years of his life. I think he was about 14 years old. His pastor in the small town he grew up in stole all of the church's money and split town. And as a result of what one idiot did, this man stayed away from God for over 50 years of his life. And so let's go to the clearest passage in the Bible so we can look at what is the relationship between church and the money. In Malachi chapter 3, the clearest teaching on this, it says, for I am the Lord. Now, to understand Old Testament prophets, Malachi was a prophet in the Old Testament, and God spoke through him. So he would... He would listen to what God had to say to the people, and he would write it down and speak it to the people. So the key to understanding the Old Testament prophets is this is actually God speaking here, for I am the Lord and I do not change. Meaning the way God operated during this time period is the way God still operates today. And then it adds some Bible humor that I, I, at least I found funny. Therefore, you're not consumed. In other words, I haven't killed you yet because I don't change. If it, was, if it was up to you, you'd be dead right now, but because I'm full of mercy and I'm full of grace and because I don't change, you're not dead yet. Yet from the days of your father, so he begins to explain why you know, they've kind of gotten themselves in trouble. From the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and you've not kept them. So here's the question, what is an ordinance? Well, an ordinance is simply a principle of ordinary Behavior. For those of us that follow Jesus, there are principles that are just ordinary for us, that we just follow. It's just ordinary behavior for a follower. So he begins to explain the ordinance that these people are not keeping. He says, return to me, and I will return to you. Now, here's the thing. If God returned to you in understanding this verse, your life would be better. The reality is if God's hand and God's favor was on you, it would change your life, says the Lord. But you say, in what way shall we return? In other words, how have we not kept your ordinances? Will a man rob God? Now, that's, that's a little hard to even fathom. How is it possible for me as a human being to sneak into heaven and steal from God's gold supply? It, the reality is I can't. That, that cannot happen. I cannot steal from God that way. So what is this? talking about, well, there's two ways to rob somebody. I can either break into your home and take what does not belong to me, or the second way is I can, if I have something that belongs to you and you want it back and I refuse to give it to you, I keep it, I'm also stealing from you. I'm robbing from you by withholding something that does not belong to me. And that's what it's talking about here. It says, will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? How, how have we robbed you, God, in tithes and offerings? In tithes and offerings. And I want to spend some time with this message talking about this word, tithe, because here is an area of Christianity that, again, this is a this is that moment where a lot of people think it's this, and it's actually not this at all. It's actually that. If you understand what it really is, it's not something you'd stay away from. It's something you would embrace with all of your heart. And tithes and offerings, and he goes on to say, you are cursed with a curse. Now, I want to point out the fact that it does not say God is going to curse you. I grew up in a church that taught me that if I did not tithe, that God was going to come get me, that God was going to curse me. And they took this verse completely out of context, misused it, and taught it in a very unhealthy way. It does not say God is going to curse you. Here's the thing. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took the full curse of God upon himself. On the cross, he received the full curse of God, meaning there's nothing left over for you. There's nothing left for God to curse you with. 
So the truth is God will not, cannot curse you. But the verse here says you're cursed. And you're cursed because you're voluntarily allowing it into your life. For you have robbed me. You've not followed this principle of ordinary behavior, even this whole nation. So let me give you the definition of curse so that this makes more sense. A curse is simply a consequence of disobedience. Anytime I disobey certain principles, there's a consequence for that choice. There's a consequence for that disobedience. If I disobey the principle of gravity and I decide that I'm going to go jump off a three-story building and I disobey the principle of gravity, how many of you understand there's going to be a curse when I hit the ground? It's not going to feel good at all. It's simply a consequence of disobedience. So he goes on and says, bring all the ties into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now let me just stop for a moment and point out a few things in this verse. The first thing I want you to notice is it uses the word bring. Bring. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say give your tithe to God. Nowhere in the Bible does the word give and the word tithe ever occur in the same sentence. Here's the reason. You can't give a tithe to God. You can't give something that does not belong to you. The tithe was already God's. It was God's in the first place. And so with the tithe, we can only bring it, we can only return it, but we cannot give something that does not belong to us. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, what I want you to notice is all throughout the Bible, and this is not the only place it, it tells us this, the tithe is always directed to the local church. That is God's house, the storehouse, where there's spiritual food for people. It's always the place where we worship God. We call that place the local church, meaning we cannot send our tithe to missionaries in Africa. We cannot you know, give a tithe to ministries in the inner city or to orphanages, and here's why. I can't designate God's money for him. I can only return God's money to him the way he's asked me to do it. And, th and that's important for people to understand because there's a lot of people that don't realize they can't decide. The same, let, me, let me give you an illustration. I can't come into your house and tell you how to spend your money. It's your money. I can't tell you that you can't buy that and you have to buy this. That's not my place in your life. It's the same between me and God. I can't tell God how to spend his money. So I can't say, God, you're gonna send some of the tithe over here and some of the tithe over here and some of the tithe over here. It's his money. All I can do is return it to his house. And the third thing I want you to notice is, where's the word offering? Remember it says, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings, but then when it gets into the actual teaching, it, it ignores the word offering. Here's why. Offerings are what we give above our tithe. Offerings are always motivated out of free will, out of love, out of cheerfulness. An offering is not an ordinance. An offering is motivated out of the goodness of our heart. The tithe is a principle of ordinary behavior. And he goes on to say, and test me now in this. And this is the only place in the entire Bible that God gives you permission to test him. You hear me a lot in our church say, just try it. Put it to the test. See if it works. And I'll say that about a lot of principles in God's word because I know the Bible works. This is one of the few places, actually the only place in the entire Bible, God gives you permission to actually test him and see if this works. See if it works. He goes, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, the word blessing does not mean financial riches. It doesn't mean you're going to become a millionaire or a billionaire or, or financially wealthy. The word blessing, when you study it in the Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in the ancient Hebrew language. It means you'll have a happy life. You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. You'll have a happy life. And here's, I gave you the definition of curse. Here's the definition of blessing. Blessing is simply a consequence of obedience. When I obey Certain principles, I'm inviting consequences in my life, good or bad. So that's what's happening. It goes on to say, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Now, you're going to have to translate this verse into your economy. However, your portfolio works, your investment, your career, your business, 
Translated into that, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, of your labor, of your hard work, of your investments, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And again, I want you to notice that God is the one saying this. This is God, a pastor did not make this up. This is God speaking, but this is the goal. This is the goal is that people call you blessed, that the people you work with say you are a delight to be around. The people who are your next door neighbors say you are delightful to have in the neighborhood because you are blessed and you're a blessing to everyone around. So let's, let's review for a moment what we just saw. First off in Malachi, we see that God has ordinances. For people who follow Jesus, there are principles that are just ordinary behavior for those of us that follow Jesus. It says when we return to him through obeying these ordinances, that God returns to us. His favor is on our life. It says we're also, it says that it is possible for us to rob God. Like I have an ability to steal from God. And I don't do that by breaking in and taking something that belongs to me. It says I do that when I withhold from him what is rightfully his, the tithe. Which brings us to an important question. What is a tithe? Well, a tithe is the according to the Bible, is the first 10% of my increase. The first 10% of my increase. Increase meaning salary, income, bonus, commission, blessing, gift, unexpected or expected. The first 10% of anything that I receive, according to the Bible, according to Scripture, belongs to God. Now, look, if I were the devil, I would want people confused about this more than anything, especially after we just read about the blessing that happens when we return to God through keeping this principle of just ordinary behavior. And we see in the body of Christ today that this, this whole area of tithing, again, is so confused. We know for a fact, because the average in America right now, you take all Christians, all churches across America today, they say the average tithe in America is 1.7%. 1.7%. So obviously, this is a principle that people think it's this, but when they discover it's actually that, they realize this is something that, that I need in my life. Life. Honestly, this is the first thing I teach somebody who's beginning their relationship with God. And here's why. Jesus said that your heart is directly connected to your money. Your heart follows your money. Your heart follows your treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be, not the other way around. And so here's the, here's the connection. When you teach somebody who is following Jesus how to tithe, you're teaching them how to send their heart after God. And when God gets their heart, he can begin to work in every area. Of, there's just something about when God has your heart, he can, he can begin to affect every area of your life. So let's look at some scriptures on the tithe, because you'll discover that this is Old Testament, this is New Testament. It's all throughout the Bible. First up is Proverbs. Proverbs says, honor the Lord with your possessions. And I thought I was just supposed to honor God with my life. Yes, you are, but also with your possessions, with your wealth, with your money, and with the first fruits of all your increase. Again, there's that word increase, which means any increase in your life. The first fruits was the word they used for tithing in the early days of the Old Testament because it was an agricultural economy. It wasn't, uh, they didn't have currency like they developed over time. So it was the first fruits. Again, the tithe is always first. It's not 10% because you had it left over at the end of the month. It's the first 10%. Before you eat any of the fruit yourself, the first part of the fruit goes to God. And then it says, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Jacob in Genesis said, this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God. Again, what do we call the place where we corporately worship God? The church. All throughout scripture, the tithe always is connected to the church. And I will present to God a tenth. That's the Hebrew word for tithe, 10% of everything he gives me. Everything I receive in my life, however it comes in, belongs to the Lord. It's his. 
Leviticus 27. Now, this is the actual verse why God has justification to say, you're stealing from me. If this verse was not in the Bible, then Malachi could not say what Malachi says by your robbing from God. Leviticus 27.30 says, a tithe, 10% of everything, 10% of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Meaning 10% of everything, the first 10%, is God's, whether I like it or not, whether I believe it or not, whether I agree with it or not, the first 10% of everything I receive belongs to God. It is holy. It is his. Now, let me ask you a question. This is all Old Testament. One of the hangups many people have, again, because this is a this is that thing. People think it's this and it's actually that is, well, that's Old Testament. That, that's all Old Testament. We're, we're New Testament. We're under grace now. So what if I could show you that Jesus himself in the New Testament, in the red letters, said that we should tithe. The question is, would you do it? If Jesus himself said you should tithe, would you do it? Well, in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus, in fact, said you should tithe, yes. You should tithe, yes. I don't know what else we need. I mean, if he is our Lord, Lord means boss, it means commander, it means ruler, it means the one in charge. If the one in charge of my life says that I should tithe, what do I have to argue with? Now, let me show you the context of the whole verse, and you'll discover that it doesn't change the meaning of this at all. The whole verse says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb garden. So what's going on is these religious people are tithing to manipulate God. They're so religious about it, and they're not tithing with the right heart motivation. They're doing it to put God in debt to them, not realizing that it was already his. You can't put God in debt with what already belonged to him. He says, you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Now, here is Jesus' golden opportunity. He could end the debate. He, he knew that people were going to debate this. He knew that people were going to argue about Old Testament, New Testament. And Jesus could have very easily said right here, you know what? That was my dad. That, that, that was Old Testament. That's the way he was. I'm different than my dad. I'm, I'm new school. My dad was old school. This is the way we're doing things now. But what does he do? He doesn't end the debate. No, he says, you should tithe. Yes, you need to keep doing that. Don't, don't leave this undone. This is an important part of our faith, but don't neglect the more important things either. So what I want to do tonight is I want to give you three points to help you understand tithing, to help you understand the, the benefit. Uh, again, the, this is that revelation for people that have kind of kept this at an arm's length, not understanding what it really was. Let me help you understand it. First is tithing is a test. Tithing is is actually a test. Jesus put the test like this in Matthew 6. You cannot serve both God and money. They, they both can't be first in your life. Only one of them can be first place in your life, meaning one of them will be first place in your life. You, you're either going to serve money, money is going to be your God, or God is going to be your God. But they both cannot be first in your life. So here's what you need to understand about tithing. Tithing is not about money. Tithing is about God wanting to simply know where he ranks in your life. God just wants to know who's first. Remember, he says, test me, test me. It's a test of who has first place in your life. And there's two things that are very unique about the tithe. The first is the priority, and the priority is the most important part of the tithe. It's not 10%. It's always the first 10%. The priority is more important than the amount. But there's also a percent. The percent also matters. So here's the question. Why 10%? Why was it, 10? was that just arbitrary? Did God just come up with the number 10? Why not seven? Why not five? Why not 15? Why not 20? Why not, why not 25 or 30%? What is significant about the number 10? Well, here's the thing. In the Bible, Numbers mean something. There's, there's something called biblical numerology where numbers always represent something. The number 10 all throughout the Bible represents test. It's one of the reasons why Malachi, God says, test me in this. Test me. Test me if I'll not come through for you. 
all throughout the Bible, 10 is test. 10 commands tested the heart of Israel. 10 plagues tested Pharaoh. Uh, Jacob's was tested 10 times through his wages being changed. There's 10 days of testing for Daniel and another 10 days of testing in Revelation. 10 virgins were tested in Matthew. Uh, Numbers tells us that the people of Israel tested God 10 times in the wilderness. All, All throughout scripture, 10 represents test. Again, God is testing our heart. Who has first place of your heart? Here's the second thing you need to know. The test is for my benefit. It's not going to change God's life, but it will change my life. The test is actually for my benefit. Jesus put it like this. Seek first. When God has first place in your life, when you, you put his kingdom first and his righteousness first, everything else is going to be taken care of. Everything else is going to be given. In other words, when you pass the test of God being first in your life, everything else comes into order. Again, tithing is not about money. Tithing is a test of who has first place in your life. You thought it was this. It's actually that. Now, let me me more importantly show you God's motivation. I think it's very important for you to understand why God came up with the principle of tithing. A lot of people have been told to do it, but they don't really understand why. Did God just, you know, God knew we were going to create currency as human beings and he needed something for us to do with our money, so he just arbitrarily came up with the concept of tithing? No, everything God created, he did for a reason. There is a reason behind it. There, there's a motivating factor. And if you see God's heart behind the tithe, it'll help you understand how powerful. It actually is. So let me take you to a story that we we began week number three of the series, and we were talking about healing and the journey of our faith, the story of Elijah. Elijah prophesied to King Ahab that it would not rain for three and a half years. And you remember, it didn't rain. For three and a half years, there was a famine and there was a drought. The story, everything in the Old Testament illustrates to us New Testament principles, according to Corinthians. Corinthians says all those stories show us principles to live our life by. So every principle, the principle of tithing, the principle of communion, the principle of water baptism, they have stories in the Old Testament. Here's the story that illustrates to us the tithe. It occurs during this famine, during the three and a half year drought. In 1 Kings 17, again, this is Elijah. The Lord said to Elijah, let me point out, God is speaking here. This is God that is setting up this thing. Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. Again, God speaking. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. God has instructed. Now, when I was in school, when an instructor wanted to find out if we were learning the material, they would give us something called a test. Yeah, a test. This is God giving this widow a test. He's testing her. He instructed her So he went to Zarephath, Elijah went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? Now realize, if she had any water at all, it would have been just a little bit. It was in the middle of a drought. As she was going to get it, he called to her, and bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. And she's not being overdramatic here. She's not exaggerating. They were literally going to die. She was a widow. She was a single mom living in poverty, nobody to take care of her. She was going to die. They were going to eat this meal and then literally starve to death. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Remember, it's a principle of first. It's a principle of who has first in your life. Are you going to put God first? And then it says, then use. Now, isn't that what tithing is? First to God, then we use the rest to manage our household, to manage our life. The first 10 goes to God, then we use the other 90 
for ourselves. What's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son? For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did. She passed the test. She put God first. She did, as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough. Can I tell you, there will always be enough for tithers. This lady did not become rich. She didn't win the lottery. She didn't become the wealthiest person in the land. This isn't about becoming rich. Again, that's, the, that's where this message went wrong. No, it's not this. It's actually that. But here's the benefit. There will always be enough. There will always be enough. Let me, let me ask you like this. Do you, if you think about this logically for a moment, do you really believe that 100% of your income without God's blessing on it can actually accomplish more and go further than 90% of your income with God's blessing on it? See, the truth is the math doesn't make sense. But 90% of your income with God's blessing on top of it will always go further than 100% of your income without God's blessing. There will always be enough flour and olive oil left in your containers just as the Lord promised through Elijah. So here's here's the question, because again, I want you to understand God's heart in this. So many people are confused about, about why tithing is in the Bible. Why is this a principle of ordinary behavior? Here's the point. Here's the this is that moment. Did God send Elijah to the widow so that the widow could provide for Elijah? Or so that God could provide for the widow? You see, so many people, they got it wrong. They think, well, the church just needs my money, and God needs me to take care of the church. No, 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 no. It was always about God providing for the widow. God did not need the widow's stuff. God did not need the widow to feed Elijah. Don't believe me? Let's go back to earlier in the chapter. Look at verse 6 in chapter 17. The ravens, birds, brought him, meaning Elijah, bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. He was eating better from birds than the widow was feeding him. Two chapters later, chapter 19, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. And he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Right before this story, God is supernaturally taking care of Elijah. Right after this story, God is supernaturally taken. God was doing just fine on his own. God did not need what the widow had. It was always a test for her. This was always for her benefit. It was always for, for her sake. So here's the point. Here, here, here is the this is that that I want you to walk away from. Tithing is not a financial transaction between me and my church. It is and always was an act of worship between me and my God. Again, tithing is not about money. It's about where does God rank in my life? Is God first in my life? And when he's first, seek first the kingdom of God, everything else is taken care of. This is why if you are a tither, let it become an act of worship. Let me show you a verse that has absolutely changed my life in understanding of the tithe. And every time I tithe, I think about this verse. Hebrews 7, again, for those of you that are hung up with, with tithing is Old Testament, here's another New Testament verse on tithing. In the one case, the tenth, that's the Greek word. Again, the New Testament is written in the Greek language. This is the Greek word for tithe. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die. So let me explain that to you. When I tithe, and again, if you are a tither, I encourage you to do it this way. I tithe during my morning devotion. When, I'm, when I get up in the morning and I'm reading my Bible and I'm spending time with God, if it's the, if it's the day that, that I get paid, then that's the morning that I tithe. God always gets the first. So, so money for me, I get direct deposit into my bank account sometime in the middle of the night so that next morning when I'm doing my morning devotions, I get out my phone, I give through our app here at the church, 
And I just tithe electronically. As I'm reading the Bible, I get out my phone. And, and let me encourage you, don't tithe. If you're a tither, don't tithe when you're paying bills. You don't pay a tithe. It's, it's not a bill. It's holy. Remember Leviticus? It's holy. Don't take what is holy and treat it like it's common. That's why I love tithing in my morning devotion so it, so it becomes an act of worship. So what I do is I get out my phone and I electronically tithe. I hit send. And what happens is our accountant who works here at the church and very efficient at what she does. She has a username and password to all of our online bank accounts. She'll log on and, and she'll see that transaction. She'll see the deposit come into our account. She'll account for it and she'll manage it and put it in the right account and budget it. But here's the deal. She's going to die one day. Like she's not going to live forever. Our account is a human. And, and she collects it here on earth. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who are going to die. But in the other case, meaning at the very same time on a kind of a parallel level, at the very same time, and this is what has changed my life, it's received by him who is declared to be living. Now, only one person was ever declared to be living. That was Jesus Christ. He is the one declared to be living. So this is the coolest thought to think about, that when I tithe here on earth, people who die receive it and collect it and manage it and put it into the right accounts. But at the very same time, when I hit that button in heaven, Jesus himself receives that tithe. I think about that every time. I think about the fact that, that when I tithe, he's first in my life, that, that he himself has received it. It is an act of worship between me and my God. That's the power. And so let me just take a moment and ask that, that right now, as you're listening to the message, if you're not driving down the road, so don't do this if you're driving, but if you're sitting at your computer or sitting at home, just take a moment, close your eyes. If you're driving, just, just take a moment and think about this. What is your response? Based on what you've received, what you've heard, what is your response? And again, don't take my word for it. This is the one time God says, test me. Test me. This is for your benefit. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that you would reveal to our heart the truth about this message. God, this is your word. I've, I've stayed away from my opinion and I've stayed close to your word in this subject because people, they don't need to know what I think. They need to know your word. They need your truth to be revealed to them. So I pray that you take the word and the scripture through this message and you illuminate it inside of people's heart and life so that what they always thought it was, it wasn't that at all. It was actually something else. Something else. And it's for them because when they put you first, God, in every area of their life, you will take care of all things. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you that you, you set the way for us by giving your best for us on that cross. So Lord, let us give you our best in every area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me.